On this episode of Tips from the Top Floor, we look at how a spaghetti strainer can help you learn about photography. There are three new and probably a bit exotic lenses on the horizon, and we'll look at the tricks of the press photographers. This is Tips from the Top Floor, episode 788, for Thursday, August the 31st, 2017. Tips from the top. Hey hello, welcome, this is Chris Markworth, you're listening to Tips from the Top Floor of the Longest Running Photography Show, coming to you from the Viewfinder Villa, right outside the gates of Hanover in Germany. I skipped an episode, I'm sorry, um, stuff. Um, it, there was an eclipse, yay, did you notice? <laughs> I'm pretty sure you did, at least in the, in the States, it was all over the media, tons of tips. I kind of deliberately didn't talk about this in the previous episodes, because there was a gazillion of tips that are all very technical, very, yeah, gear focused, very what are the proper camera settings focused. And uh, yeah, plenty of that information out there. The one tip that I gave, that's a bit too late for that now, but maybe for the next eclipse, is uh, was on the Tech Guy radio show uh, with Leo Laporte um, to maybe turn around and not not try to take the same picture that 500 million people have taken, uh, but instead focus on the people who are there with, I don't know, groups of people with those eclipse glasses looking into the sky. Um, all sorts of stuff. The animals, everything. There's a ton of stuff that can be looked at that is probably cooler than the eclipse itself. All right, but I mean, that is kind of true for almost any other thing that's when you go to some place where everyone else takes the same photos that you would turn around um but there were a few pictures that came out of the eclipse that i was really happy about and i'm not even talking about the 1500 millimeter lens on a big tripod uh corona kind of thing there's plenty of those they are all lovely they're all amazing but a few things that i think lend themselves to learning about photography really well are the pinhole cameras that people made and uh, or or the pinhole cameras that were already made that people just used and uh, a lot of kids did uh the colanders for example where like the, the the spaghetti strainers um that have lots of little holes in there and if you google colander eclipse just put those two words in google look at the image results you'll see a ton of pictures of well, the shadows of colanders and the little tiny, a hundred little eclipses on the ground coming through the holes of the colander, which is, I mean, normally you wouldn't notice that that's what the colander does because if you hold it out in the sun, well, you get little circular uh, spots of light on the on the pavement, which of course is because it's a pinhole camera, not because those holes are round. If you took Th th triangular holes, uh, th square holes, star-shaped holes, you would still get round little images on the pavement because that's what a pinhole camera does. It projects what is in front of it and puts it upside down on the other side. So you can do this right now. Take a take a black sheet of paper, cut in, or I think any, any sheet will probably do, cut in a little star and then go out and hold it in the sun and see what kind of a picture it projects. Yep, it's not a little star. It is a circular shape. And so when, when you take that colander out uh, during an eclipse, yeah, you get a little picture of the eclipse. And that's, I love those. There's other naturally occurring pinhole cameras that um, you can see on these as well. And that's where the light uh, has to go through a tree. The, the leaves on a tree, they leave up little holes. And there is, again, plenty of photos of uh, the shadows and the light patches under trees during the eclipse that show little eclipses. And that's awesome. And that's a really cool way to learn about pinhole cameras. So I love that. That's really what, what what I learned from this eclipse is, hey, this is a great learning tool. And the kids who did that will probably not forget that. There is another thing I want to briefly talk about. And it's, you know me, I've, I usually don't do product introductions here on the show. 
And and just to be clear, what what I'm going to talk about had there's I didn't have any prior information. I haven't had my hands on what I'm going to talk about. I'm not being paid for this, but it's really exciting to me. And that is three new three new tilt shift lenses from Canon. A, a 50 millimeter macro, a 90 millimeter millimeter macro, and a 135 millimeter macro lens. All three tilt shifts. Um, they took the 45 millimeter out of the the lineup so now there are five tilt shift lenses in the lineup I, I think that must be the the company with the most tilt shift lenses and uh if you've listened to this show <laughs> just a short while you probably caught the idea that i am a fan of tilt shift lenses i have two of them the, the 24 and a 45 i use both of them um um the 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 new book that i've just uh, handed the manuscript in for uh has a chapter on tilt shift it's something that's near and dear to my heart i do this i use this pretty much every day and that's why i find it this so exciting now most of you will go hey what what am i going to do with that cuz i'll never buy one of these expensive lenses cuz that's what they are i mean this type of lens caters to a niche uh, the prices of the lenses are quite high. We're talking over two thousand bucks, and for many people out there, they didn't even pay that much for their camera. So, uh, yeah, I fully understand that. Um, but you can do things with these lenses that you can't do with any traditional lens, and that's why I find them so exciting. The uh, the, the tilt shift look is often associated with miniature look, with the, the making things look small, look tiny. It's been overused. I mean, it's one of these things that when I see I yawn, because it's like, ah, I've seen this a million of times now. But that's only one of the many things it'll do. And it's that's actually a byproduct of what it is, what is what is what it was made for. Now with uh with professional photographers, the tilt shift is often associated with wide angle photography, for example, where you would correct falling lines. Um, which means you just just you stand in front of a building, you have to tilt the camera backwards to get the whole building on the picture. And that tilting of the camera, that makes the lines converge on the top. And with a shift lens, you can just shift it up, shift the picture wherever you want. And the verticals in the, in the uh, picture stay parallel, which makes for much more cleaned up pictures architecture photographers love that um, you can use that in landscape photography you can even use it in portraiture um, now the longer the lens uh, the less the verticals have a problem so when we look at a telephoto lens the the focus of the photo is often the depth of field because that that is what what changes when you go longer focal lengths your depth of field will be more shallow. You will not have as much in focus, and that's where these lenses come in. Now, I do, I do also have the the forty five millimeter tilt shift lens, and I use that mainly for stuff like product photography, because when I do a tabletop setup where you have something on a table and then diagonally from the top you look at it uh, through a lens, you're relatively close. It's um, it's a somewhere medium focal length, and you will often want to use apertures that are not f16 f22 because that will create its own problems so you will shoot a bit a bit wider open and then you run out of focus and what you can do with a tilt shift lens is you can you can tilt the focal plane and that will correct the focus and the longer the lens the more interesting that gets um i've used that 45 in portraiture as one thing um if you use a longer focal length you might have noticed that you might have both eyes in focus, but that means you have to shoot with a small aperture. If you want to shoot with a bigger aperture to throw the background out of focus or other less important parts of the frame out of focus, um, then that's where these new lenses come in because now you can tilt the focal plane so that both eyes are, are in focus while maintaining an open aperture. Um, the ability to shoot wide open while still controlling where the focus falls, that's one of the strengths of these kind of lenses and um, moving to be able to move that focal plane through the 3D space um, is just yeah works for portraiture works for tabletop photography. Now all these three new lenses also have um, a macro 
label on them, which means they are made to they are they're designed to focus close. Uh, because that's one of the biggest issues of macro is shallow depth of field. You have tiny depth of field. And photographers will use um, stuff like focus stacking, for example. But, I mean, you can only use that if your subject doesn't move. If it moves, then focus stacking, there's no way to use that. So if you're out shooting insects and things on, uh, well, actually living insects, then that t that that tilt ability will be uh, quite interesting. And that's where these lenses shine. Now, don't let yourself be fooled by the macro level because it doesn't mean that you can only shoot macro with it. It means they are optimized for macro. They are optimized for short focus distances and you can get re really close with them and get a really uh, decent magnification. But they will work just fine in regular settings as well. So a macro lens... Actually, macro lenses are often preferred by portrait photographers for, for the special look they create. They have this slight softness to them at, at further distances, which makes them a really great fit for a lot of uh, the portraiture situations. So in total, I'm blown away that Canon came up with three new tilt shift lenses. I, that's amazing. And that, that makes their lineup in that area five tilt shift lenses now. So, yeah, I'm... Um, uh, I'm still trying to find a good way to get my hands on those without breaking the bank. So <laughs> any tips, welcome. And um, that's it. That's it. Enough about the tools. Let's talk about photography. Okay, before we talk about some of the tricks of the press photographers, just a quick reminder. It's awesome how many of you have sent a question so far. I always love hearing your voices on this show. It, it just makes it so much better. So keep those voicemails coming. And it's really easy. Just pick up your smartphone, use the voice recording app of your choice, and then just speak into it as if you would do a phone call with a friend. And then once you're happy with what you've recorded, send it to voice at tfttf.com. That's voice at tfttf.com. I want to hear from you. I'd also like to take a second to thank everyone who supports the show, especially during times when there are no advertisers, like on this episode or on the last few episodes. It's always hard to justify putting the time into making a new episode when there are other things that help keeping the lights on. And now, of course, I love doing this show. Um, if you haven't noticed, well, I've done this for 12 years, so I would probably do it anyway. But your support makes this decision so much easier. On the one hand, there are all you wonderful Patreon supporters who chip in a dollar or more per episode. That's really appreciated and really makes a difference. And then, of course, there's everyone else who goes out and leaves a rating or review on Apple Podcasts and all the other ways that you can support me. You'll find a whole list at tfttf.com slash support. And I thank you all for helping make it happen. You rock. Hello, Chris. My name is Ben from the Montreal area in Quebec. I've been a listener of the show in the early days, and I've been back at listening for about two years since I upgraded my DSLR. My question is about hand-free low-light photography. You see, I work as night shift paramedic, and sometimes I see press photographer on scene taking picture without a tripod or a flash. Back home, when I try to take picture with similar lighting conditions, I'm never able to achieve the results I see on the news websites. I tried playing with the aperture, the ISO, and the lens image stabilizer. Do you have any tricks, any recommendation? A wide aperture is great, but narrowing my depth of field, and I'm not sure about the autofocus is doing a good job when the light is too low. I'm using a Canon 70D with the 1585F 3.5 to 5.6 IS USM, and also the fantastic 15mm F1.8. Thanks a lot for your infos, and keep up the good work. Hey Ben, thank you. First of all, I have to say your gear is not at fault. Your gear is not most likely not the problem. The lenses you have should work just fine. The camera you have is is great. Um, but there are a few tricks that the press photographers have, and they they have. I mean, if you are in low light situation, 
and stuff might be moving. There are three things you want to control. The first thing is the brightness of the picture. The second thing is the stability of the camera and of yourself to avoid camera shake. And the third is the focus. And that's all, all those three are kind of uh, a balance. They um, kind of depend on each other. And let's start with the brightness. The brightness, of course, you can throw money at it by brighter glass. So if you have a longer lens and that's at f2.8, hey, that'll probably give you a better, a brighter picture than if you shoot with f4, for example. The other thing you can throw at that uh, equation is higher ISO. And higher ISO, yeah, comes with its own costs, but uh, I'd rather have a noisy picture than uh, a picture with camera shake in that kind of a situation. Now, that's the first thing. The second, the stability. And there, of course, yeah, there are image stabilizers, and they can, depending on the system, be in camera or in the lens. And they will stabilize or do the best to stabilize your own motion. They will not stabilize the motion of your subject. So if the subject moves, your camera can be stabilized as much as it wants to be. You will still have camera shake or in this case, um, subject shake. And that is something that that these press photographers, they, they kind of develop a sense over when to press that shutter when the motion stops or when they anticipate the motion to stop. They will often also shoot in bursts because what happens if you shoot five pictures in a row at, I don't know, at 10 frames a second? You will have a lot of motion in that, but there's a good chance if you want to stop your own motion, you, you will, in one of those shots, probably hit that peak where you move and then move backwards. So you will most likely find that one shot that is important and that that's the one that has the the least shake and then delete the others and of course stability can also be improved uh, by using even higher isos if you use a high iso you can turn down the shutter speed and this way you will get more stable pictures now the third is the focus and focusing it's an well in low light can be a bit of an art form because there are systems that inter act with each other there's the camera and the camera has a focusing system and that focusing system has a certain sensitivity and then your lenses if you have a lens at f2.8 that will be easier to focus in the low light than a lens that starts at 3.5 or at f4 but then not all of the of the brighter lenses focus well depending on the combination with the camera. I had a bit of focus hunting, for example, with the 51.8. And then when I tried another lens um, in the same range, but a 51.4, that focused better. And that was not that big of a difference in brightness. So sometimes the, the, the way the lens is built can uh, have an influence there. Of course, better focus also can come from the focusing system in the camera. Because the more expensive models typically have better autofocus, even even um, to the point where they are used by bird photographers and shoot bird in in uh, in dusk, uh, coming flying in in the air, and they still grab the focus. They are amazing sometimes. Um, or another way to go is focus manually. If you have a lens that allows that, and if you have the experience, then a manual focus might be. The best solution in this kind of a situation where the camera wouldn't really get the focus well. Now again, the problem of shooting handheld in low light can partially be solved by throwing money at it, right? By buying better glass, sure, why not? Uh, getting a camera that is better as at a high ISO, sure, you can throw money at that. Or getting a camera that has better autofocus, definitely can throw money at that. But it is also solved by technique. And that won't cost you anything. Just practice. And mainly it's a learning about stability. At, about how to hold the camera steady for longer exposures. And that comes down to several factors. For example, your stance. How do you stand? Do you stand solidly with both feet on the ground? Are those feet together? Are they slightly apart? Um, do you lean against something like a wall or do you lean against yourself by, by holding the camera on, on hand and then 
pushing your elbow into your rib cage to make a kind of a almost like a tripod there um do you hold the camera at the grip with your right hand and is this how you support the weight of the camera if that's the case then there is an inherent um a danger of shake because you trying to hold the camera with the same hand that you that you uh, trip the shutter or do you have your camera on your left hand resting on the left hand so the right hand doesn't have to carry any weight that makes you much more stable and then i recently again talked to an archer someone who does that almost professionally and archers do something that photographers should learn too an archer will um shoot the arrow let go of the arrow and the archer will not move until that arrow is well on its way or even hit its target and if you try to emulate that as a photographer if you do not try to anticipate the motion of taking your camera down that will in itself make you a more steady photographer um, and one last thing don't use the lcd the thing on the back of your camera yeah you can compose a picture on that but then it means you're holding your camera up on your arms instead of touching the camera to your eyebrow when looking through the viewfinder that is a point of stability and all these things together if you if you practice that and it takes practice then you will become a better and more st stable photographer and that will give you more of these kind of shots one last thing that you can also do with your existing camera is shooting bursts because uh, again those press photographers will do that <laughs> they will shoot bursts and they will shoot five pictures of the same thing and then delete four of them and choose the one that has the least camera shake. But most important, I recommend you don't look at your photos on a screen zoomed in at 100%. Because that is how we tend to, to judge focus. But if you have the, that, that picture in a newspaper, that's at lower resolution. Even on a website, it's at lower resolution. Uh, and you won't zoom in all the way. You don't even, on a website, you don't even get the full resolution. You get a much reduced resolution and every bit, little bit of unsharpness in the picture is probably going to be swallowed by that. Um, these guys know what they're doing and they know what target they shoot for. They know what result they shoot for. And then one last thing, and then I think we <laughs> we've covered this. Photojournalists often use their their understanding of light they've spent a lot of time to learn about light uh, to enhance simple things like edge contrast. If you have a subject in backlight, there is contrast at the edges where the light hits and that will improve your perception of sharpness of the photo. So my conclusion is this. Experience, I think, is the number one factor here. If you do something every day, like a press photographer, you will inevitably get better at it. They do this every day. They shoot every single day and they talk to each other and they exchange their experiences and their tips and tricks. You can also gain something by throwing a bit more dollars at it, but you'd be surprised how much you can squeeze out of your existing gear just by doing a bit more practice. And that was it for this week on Tips from the Top Floor. The food Slack challenge is still up. If you're not on the Slack just yet, it's free. And all you have to do is go to tfttf.com slash yslack to participate in our little photo challenge about food this time. All information is again at tfttf.com slash yslack, W-H-Y-S-L-A-C-K. And we'll be happy to welcome you into our little TFTTF community there with discussion channels about everything from gear talk to show and tell to the challenges, even about film photography. Again, it's all at tfttf.com slash yslack. Music for the show by Jeff Smith, Silent Partner, and Hans Peter Kagrud, publishing by Release Pixie, Matt Rester, Armstead, Slack, Imitations by CIO Russ, and if you want to join the discussion again, tftgf.com slash yslack, W-H-Y-S-L-A-C-K. I remember that I told you there'd be sunshine after rain. My name's Chris Marquardt. Follow me on Facebook and on Twitter at Chris Marquardt. That's Chris, M-A-R-Q-U-A-R-D-T. And of course, go out and take amazing photos. Be nice to each other. And happy shooting. <laughs> <laughs>